All right, so chapter 20, this is arts on page 380 in your book. This one is going to be about nutritional aspects of certain alterations in the oral cavity. Right out of the gate, uh, one of the biggest sort of um, alterations of the oral cavity is going to be ortho, right? Anytime that they're wearing braces, uh, there's going to be an increased risk for decalcification around those brackets, for gingival inflammation, right? They are uh, just a, a great source of plaque retention around those, those brackets. Um, soft tissue trauma from orthodontic appliances, um, you know, those of you who have braces or who have ever worn braces, you know, uh, root resorption because, uh, you know, they're moving teeth through bones. Uh, there's a good chance that they could end up, um, you know, shaving off a little bit of the, the tooth root. Um, accumulation of food debris in brackets and wires, and then chaotic meal patterns and snack habits. So because there are different recommendations for what you should be eating when you have uh, braces, that doesn't mean that uh, everybody follows those recommendations. And then of course, you know, you have to make alterations to the way you eat whenever you have braces. So some considerations here are going to be that right after you have the braces put on or every time you go in, you know, and you get your braces tightened was what uh, we called it when I was a kid. But uh, anytime you go and, you know, you get a new wire or new bands put on, it might mean that, you know, you need to eat either soft foods or even liquid, depending on how uncomfortable you are, how much they're, you know, how, how many rubber bands you had to wear the last two days. Um, you might need to have a much softer diet because your your teeth and your your periodontal ligaments those are all pretty tender and sore because they're they're having to really um, move and then emphasize the importance of oral self care daily fluoride use and even possibly alcohol free antimicrobial rinses um, you know it's it is certainly different when they have braces you know and and we're saying you should floss that it's kind of hard to floss around braces and you know they're not going to school for dental hygiene so they may not care as much as you do um and so you're going to want to give them a lot of of uh kind of a stern talking to but but in a nice way about how important it is um and if you have a picture like this one uh that's a good scare tactic because this is what braces look like if you don't take good care of them and avoid the foods you should. Um, you want to tell them to avoid soft drinks, energy drinks, and sports drinks, along with uh, those fermentable carbohydrates that are really retentive um, because the citric acid can uh, decalcify the enamel as well. Okay, so you know, all of course, all fermentable carbohydrates um, will will do this, but specifically anything with citric acid can, even if it doesn't have sugar. But um, you know, while it's important to tell them all the things they can't have while they have braces, it's also you know maybe a good idea to to tell them some of the foods they can have, right? Which we want to promote that adequate nutritional intake because they're having to uh, you know repair hard and soft tissue um, as those teeth try to move through that bone. It's very uncomfortable. They're in pain because of all of the the things that are happening inside there and, and that takes energy and nutrients. The next alteration that we might see in the oral cavity that we might need to change our nutritional uh, recommendations for is going to be xerostomia. This one you're going to see a little bit more in your uh, geriatric patients, uh, but really, you know, anyone kind of 45 and older is probably dealing with something uh, getting close to this. The most common factor is going to be drug induced. Um, you know, here in the United States, uh, you know, after a certain age, uh, polypharma, which is taking more than one medication, is pretty common. Um, and so more than 400 commonly used medications will cause xerostomia. Your book has a good list on page 381. 
of the types of medications that can cause xerostomia. Um, and then especially, you know, here in San Antonio, even young people who are dealing with allergies um, because antihistamines will cause xerostomia. So you'll see, you know, even children and teenagers who are dealing with xerostomia that is drug induced. Um, the, another thing that's going to cause xerostomia is going to be any type of disease. So autoimmune diseases like Sjogren's, lupus, uh, and rheumatoid arthritis may have also a side effect. Well, Sjogren's for sure, but the other two may have a side effect of xerostomia. Uh, chronic diseases like diabetes, right? That's more of an inflammation thing. So if the inflammation affects the oral cavity in this way, then it, it could certainly do so. Um, depression, anxiety, stress, or fear, these might also cause xerostomia. Uh, I kind of see that as correlational. Maybe they're also taking a medication for, uh, you know, an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety uh, medication. But, um, you know, maybe just the, the disease itself does, uh, to a certain degree, reduce saliva. Um, and obviously, head and neck radiation is going to be very, very uh, harmful to uh, salivary flow. So then when your patients have xerostomia and they come in and they're like, oh, yeah, I have dry mouth or, you know, they open and it makes that sound. <laughs> um, you're going to be like, oh, good luck with that. Sorry. It sucks to be you. Um, no, you're not going to do that. So you're going to carefully assess um, their overall diet and, and you're going to take careful attention to vitamin A, vitamin B6, vitamin C, the amount of fluids. This is probably my number one question is, you know, are you drinking more water? Uh, how much fiber they're eating? If they're getting enough potassium, iron, calcium, zinc, and protein, you know, if you're doing that full nutritional uh, counseling with them, you're going to get all of that information. You're going to counsel that patient about some of the techniques and products to relieve those symptoms of xerostomia. So, you know, they're probably uncomfortable. They probably wake up at night, you know, and they feel like they've got cotton balls in their mouth um, and it's uncomfortable. It's, it's not um, a pleasant experience to have uh, xerostomia. So um, you're going to want to talk to them about maybe, you know, drinking more water throughout the day, sipping on water, um, and then make sure you're telling them, you know, it needs to be tap water, right? Because certain bottled waters are a little bit too acidic. Um, and then you're also going to talk to them about some of the products that we uh, we can recommend to our patients. Um, there's like things like Biotene, uh, Colgate makes some oral rinses. They have a little bit more glycerin in them. It makes them slightly less viscous. And so uh, what that does is it will kind of coat the oral uh, mucosa a bit more for a little bit longer, and that's going to help them get a little bit more relief for longer. Other things you can recommend are like lozenges or uh, hard candies, but you want to be careful when it comes to hard candies because with xerostomia, they're at a higher risk of cavities, right? So we want to make sure we're off, we're, we're recommending and giving kind of a special stress to um, using lozenges and hard candies that are one, you know, sugar free for sure, but maybe even more like xylitol um, ones because they will actively prevent cavities. Um, and then lastly, we're going to talk to our patients about avoiding certain foods. So anything dry, like saltines. Um, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but um, you eat a couple of saltine crackers and you're like, okay, I'm good. Thank you. That's that's it for me. Um, crumbly foods, like maybe a whole wheat muffin. Um, anything sticky, like peanut butter, right? You're not going to have good oral clearance of that. <laughs> Um, and then anything spicy, uh, alcohol, commercial mouthwashes, specifically they're talking about commercial mouthwashes that contain alcohol. So basically Listerine, right? They kind of center on that one. And then tobacco. Uh, a, a lot of patients who deal with xerostomia don't recognize that Listerine does contain alcohol and that will actually dry their mouth out more. So if you get a patient who, uh, who has xerostomia or maybe even kind of you think they have xerostomia, but they say they, they don't really deal with that, make sure you tell them, hey, stay away from Listerine. It's, it's too harsh. Uh, they make some Listerines that don't have um, alcohol, but uh, for the most part, it's just stay away from it. Um, the recommendation for me is going to be either, you know, biotin or some type of other rinse. Uh, biotin also makes toothpastes, uh, but another company is ACT. They make lozenges, they make rinses, and they even make uh, certain toothpastes 
that are more specifically geared towards treating xerostomia. Overall, the goal for our patient with xerostomia is going to be to protect the oral cavity from any kind of destructive effects like root cavities. Um, and we want to treat existing conditions, right? Any restorations or, or you know, things they have going on. And of course, we want to provide relief from how uncomfortable it is uh, when they have dry mouth in order to improve the quality of their diet and ultimately the quality of life. Okay, other considerations that we'll make for our patients who have xerostomia would be probably to recommend that they eat foods that have a little bit more of like gravy and sauce, something that's a little bit more liquidy uh, in order to kind of make up the difference for the amount of saliva that they would produce. Uh, I chose this picture because um, I would never eat my oatmeal at this consistency. Um, I prefer oatmeal to be like a thicker kind of consistency than this, but uh, I saw this picture and it just kind of makes me cringe. But this would be the kind of oatmeal consistency you would recommend for your patient right this would be a pretty good um, meal for them and then you want to have them choose something that's a bit more nutrient dense you want something that's gonna have you know the vitamins and proteins and things like that so you know beyond like a um, a kale smoothie, um, you're going to want to give them something like macaroni and cheese, which is going to have, you know, that that dairy protein in it and is going to be pretty um, appealing to them. Um, cottage cheese. Um, this is kind of one of those hit or miss. People either love it or hate it. Um, and then applesauce, too, is going to be a, a really good choice. But make sure you're you're recommending that they have these kinds of foods, like, well, applesauce specifically, but they get the one that doesn't have the added sugar because that's not going to be good for them with, uh, with the um, higher risk for cavities. All right, so the next uh, alteration in the oral cavity that might affect their diet is going to be root cavities or root caries. So uh, this is someone who probably has xerostomia, right? That's that's a, one of the indications for this. Um, and they're gonna be particularly susceptible to decay around that area, right above the CEJ, where a little tiny bit of the dentin, not the dentin, the cementum of the root is exposed. And because it is you know, so much less dense, it demineralizes at a much higher pH than does enamel, right? So just to reiterate, enamel, demineralizes at 5.5 pH. That is the critical point or critical pH for enamel. But cementum and dentin will both demineralize at 6.7 or lower, right? That is like right underneath 7, right? That there's not a whole lot of difference between 7 and 6.7 okay so it is it is quick there's a quick turnaround any type of acidity is going to to do this but also we kind of have to think about you know toothbrush abrasion that's going to be one of the bigger uh things here so you know the ph of the mouth at 6.7 will cause that cementum and dentin to weaken but it's only when we go in with our you know, medium hard toothbrushes and we start going, you know, a horizontal scrub pattern in order to brush away um, these little, these little, well, brush into these little notches on the teeth here, right? Uh, usually the patients come in and they're like, my fingernail fits here when it didn't used to. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, you probably shouldn't put your fingernail there. Um, abrasion is gonna be that permanent depletion of tooth surfaces as a result of pathologic tooth wear, such as toothbrush abrasion. The other thing that we wanna keep in mind is that um, they could have dentin hypersensitivity, right? Anytime that the teeth are um, exposed in some way, um, you know, if the dentin is exposed, especially if they have root caries like that, their dentin is probably somehow uh, uh, involved. And because of this, they could be pretty sensitive to cold foods, which means that, you know, if they've grown up drinking ice water, they may not like water at room temperature. And they're going to have a hard time getting enough water in their day because they don't, they can't drink it cold because it's, you know, it hurts their teeth. So they don't want to drink it room temperature. So they don't drink water. Right. Um, and this, I mean, this goes for a lot of different foods. Like if, you know, it's, not something that they want maybe maybe it's uh, milk and they don't 
uh, you know, they're cold milk is too cold for them. Um, and I mean, I don't know anybody who drinks warm milk. I, I hear about it, but I've never had it. Um, and so that's going to play a role in the kinds of foods that they choose. Um, dent and hypersensitivity, the number one cause of this is going to be erosion. And it's a major cause that often occurs as a result of exposure to acids, right? Like we talked about our pHs, right? And then um, uh, in, uh, that's in our foods and beverages, and then as well as like acid from gastroesophageal reflux. So if they have GERD or if they uh, are bulimic, then they're going to be really creating a, a very acidic environment. Okay, so then if they have root caries or dental hypersensitivity, we're going to recommend that they come in for a three-month recall probably, right? It depends on their oral self-care. Um, we're probably going to want to give them a topical fluoride application in office. We are going to want to be putting fluoride varnish on their teeth as often as we possibly can. And the reason for this is because we want to remineralize as much of that tooth structure as we can possibly get. We also want to recommend that they're using uh, fluoridated toothpaste at home, right? We, every single chance we can get, we want to expose those seeds to fluoride. And then, it, I mean, keeping right along with that, we want to make sure they're having fluoridated water. We want to recommend that they brush before they consume acidic foods in order to neutralize the pH of their saliva before they have that acidic food. Um, and then you also want to tell people don't brush right after um, because what happens is if you, you know, you eat food and then you brush right away, if that food was acidic and the, the enamel or the dentin is weakened and then you go in there with your toothbrush, you're going to brush away tooth structure more so than you would if you just waited until your pH came back up, give it about you know the 20 to 40 minutes, depending on the type of, of uh, carbohydrate you ate, and then you'll be able to brush and do so safely. We wanna recommend that people use a straw for their acidic drinks uh, because not everyone will kind of swish the drink around in their mouth before they swallow it when they use a straw. Um, we want to tell them to avoid foods that cause sensitivity, obviously, don't, you know, if it hurts, don't do it, and then decrease the intake of their fermentable carbohydrates. So this is another one of those things. We want to educate them on how they get cavities and how, you know, how did they get hypersensitivity. Um, you know, we want to talk to them about the pH level of foods. Um, it can be kind of complicated for patients, but if you're like, hey, pay attention to this, look at this thing, you know, this is causing this problem for you, then, you know, maybe it's the first time they've heard it and they, they don't understand, so they don't take it in. But the second time, time and the third time and the fifth, you know, the 20th time they've come in uh, and the dental hygienist is like, hey, you have a problem here, like figure it out, then eventually they will hear it. Um, the next factor, the alteration uh, in the cavity that will affect their nutrition is going to be tooth loss, right? So about 82% of people will retain all or most of their natural teeth. So that means there's a good percentage of people out there who are going to lose their natural teeth pretty early. Um, many people believe that tooth loss is just a normal aspect of aging. You get older, you get dentures, right? And that's not true. We need to break that stigma, that stereotype. Um, they will have a compromised nutritional intake. I, I am a big, big believer that nutrition uh, plays a role in you know, uh, end stage life. So uh, if you want to, you know, um, stage off, stave off uh, Alzheimer's disease and dementia for as long as you can, it's going to take that nutrition. It's going to take, um, you know, proper diet and exercise in order to prevent a lot of those diseases uh, because, you know, all of it's connected. Um, and in order to do so, in order to be able to eat those crunchy, healthy, fibrous foods, you need your natural teeth. Um, so a compromised nutritional intake can be a result of tooth loss, tooth mobility, edentulous status, and discomfort. If you've ever met someone who just got dentures um, or who has dentures, you talk to them about what happened when they first got it, you can barely eat when you first get them. It takes a while to figure out how to eat 
with dentures. Um, with dentures, uh, people may have approximately one fifth of the chewing ability. Um, so whenever people tell me like, you know, I don't care about my teeth, I'm just gonna um, get them all pulled out and get fake teeth, um, and, you know, and get dentures, I'm like, oh, okay, you don't like food then, huh? You don't, you don't like to eat uh, steak or, or you know, you don't, you don't like to eat food that you have to chew up because <laughs> you're not gonna be able to do it as well. And then uh, the number of teeth that they have present. Um, and the presence of advanced mobility is going to determine their food choices. So, you know, someone who only has two teeth, they're probably not going to um, uh, eat a whole apple, right? They're not going to bite into an apple like that. Uh, they're probably choosing softer, easier foods to eat. So some of those dental hygiene considerations for our patients whenever they uh, get dentures or, or uh, removable prosthodontics, um, that during their appointment preceding placement of that new denture, we want to talk to them about, hey, you've got a challenge coming up. You know, when they come in and it's clear their teeth are kind of, um, you know, not going to be savable um, and they're, you know, we know the dentist is going to give them this treatment plan. That's when we want to start whispering in their ear, you know, those uh, those sweet nothings of of all the foods that they need to to kind of prep themselves for and, and kind of what's coming and and give them those tools to be able to be successful later. OK, so, uh, you know, we want to talk to our patients about maybe, hey, consider getting like a protein supplement or just for a little while or, you know, hey, you're probably going to want to have mashed potatoes instead of french fries for a while and that's okay and and you know kind of get them kind of thinking about those things kind of munching on it mulling it over um, that swallowing foods can sometimes be a challenge for new denture wearers um, you know not only chewing it up uh, but swallowing it can be difficult we want to encourage the intake of dairy products that are fortified with vitamin D because once they pull out all of those teeth, as you guys know, that bone that is there will just resorb. If we're not stimulating the bone that is in uh, around our teeth of our alveolar ridges, the bone will resorb. So we want to slow that down as much as we can by giving them a uh, higher intake of calcium and vitamin D. And then it's going to be, you know, possible that they need some type of liquid nutritional supplement. So like I was saying, maybe a protein shake or like Ensure or something like that in order to make up those calories and nutrients that they'll need while they're healing because they're probably not going to be eating uh, the same types of foods. Uh, but again, we want to be very careful when, we, when they're having these extractions and they're going to be, you know, getting dentures, things like that. We want to talk to them about, you know, if you're going to have a drink, you want to have it in a cup and you want to be able to kind of tip it into the mouth, not use a straw. Keeping in line with that, when they're having those extractions done or they're having any kind of oral maxillofacial surgery. So this is going to be even for some of your teenagers who are having kind of that jaw surgery in order to maybe correct some type of malocclusion. Um, we're going to try to assess our patient's nutritional needs prior to having the procedure, right? Because if we can get them kind of on the right track, figuring out, you know, do they have enough nutrients sort of supply in order to get them through this, they're going to be able to cope better later after the surgery, okay? People who are healthy before they have surgery heal faster than people who try to get healthy after. Patients who are malnourished due to a variety of conditions, right? Any kind of disease or condition like anorexia, um, people who are recovering from chemotherapy, um, alcoholism, they're all going to be at that higher risk. They all have some type of um, chronic inflammation or, or something like that that's going to cause their immune system to be lower. And when this is the case, we really need to refer them over to a registered dietitian who can give them, you know, a fully comprehensive dietary uh, plan and not as much just like some um, generalized guidelines or recommendations that we would be able to make. All right, so some of those considerations are going to be if our patient comes back and they've lost a ton of weight since they had their teeth pulled out, right? We don't necessarily want our patients to lose a ton of weight right after surgery because that means that they're not consuming the amount of carbohydrates in order to 
even maintain their body, right? They're, they're in a calorie deficit anytime they've lost a bunch of weight, which means that when they need more calories in order to be able to heal and repair tissue, they aren't even getting enough to maintain what they have, right? So they're not going to heal as fast, and that's not a good thing. Um, and we want to emphasize the recommendations from my plate. So, uh, you know, we want to give them that uh, diet that has variety, and we want to make sure they're eating enough calories, enough carbs, proteins, fats, um, enough vitamins and minerals, making sure that they have a nice balance on their plate. Uh, you know, after they're recovering from surgery, we want to make sure that they're eating um, more dense, like nu nutrient dense foods. So typically this is something that's lower in calories, but that's not really a factor when it comes to, you know, how much they're eating for post-op. Um, we just want to make sure they're eating more frequently so that they can get all of those calories that they need. Um, and then, of course, when they're having a hard time with that or they're, you know, they're struggling with some type of painful operation or post-op, um, then we want to make sure that they remember, hey, there are plenty of liquid nutritional supplements that are out there that can help uh, sort of bridge this gap until that patient is able to, uh, to chew food again. And then uh, the loss of alveolar bone. So this is another one of those alterations in the oral cavity that's going to affect our nutritional intake. So um, the reason for loss of alveolar bone can have a couple of different factors, and it might be that they've you know, not been able to have enough calcium throughout their lifetime um, that's going to get them in that negative calcium balance. Um, they could have had some tooth extractions that's going to, you know, cause that bone to resorb. Um, and then education in masticatory efficiency. So this is more like telling people like, hey, you know, when there's some sort of stimulation, then the bone won't resorb as much as it will if there's no stimulation. So, you know, if your patient is wearing the denture and is chewing with the denture, then it's going to, you know, be pressing on that alveolar tissue and it's going to, um, to help in kind of keeping the bone where it is. If the patient is not wearing it or, you know, they're eating a very soft diet where they're not getting uh, kind of enough um, stimulation there, then their bone is going to resorb uh, a bit faster. But also we want to think about osteoporosis as a, a part of this too. So, you know, if the patient is struggling just with bone mass in general, alveolar bone is also going to uh, be lost. Okay, so next up is glossitis, and this, as uh, I'm sure you all know, is going to be that inflammation of the tongue, um, and it, it could be painful, right? Uh, but it can be caused by a lot of different things. So it could be bacterial, fungal, or viral. It can be caused by drugs, um, medications, <laughs> and, oh, I guess also drugs, and then psychological stress, um, allergic reactions, uh, nutrient deficiencies. We've talked about iron um, causing, you know, uh, pernicious anemia, things like that. Um, and then also it could be just completely unknown. Um, at this point, your book also talks about benign migratory glossitis, which is a really fancy way of saying geographic tongue. Uh, next time I throw these words at you, I'm going to want you to remember them. Uh, but it's not going to be on your quiz. I'm not going to put it on there because um, I think it's too fancy. But at some point, I'm going to be like, hey, what's a benign migratory glossitis? And you're going to be like, I have no idea. Um, Dental hygiene considerations for if your patient is, is dealing with this is going to be to choose soft, nutrient-dense foods. This is only if our patients are um, dealing with pain with their tongue. So, you know, if they're, if they're having a hard time with dealing with that pain, then they're going to want to eat foods that are a bit easier to eat, right? Um, we're also going to want to recommend that they take liquid nutritional supplements like um, instant breakfast, they're talking about like Ensure or like a protein shake of some kind that will help them to get all of their caloric and uh, nutritional needs. Uh, your book also talks about lichen planus at this point and how that one is a chronic inflammatory disease um, that can, uh, can also be associated with glossitis. 
Okay, so then last but certainly not least is going to be temporal mandibular disorder. Uh, it's kind of always a, a common dental professional giggle when uh, people come in and they say, oh my gosh, I have TMJ. And it's like, yeah, everybody has TMJ, um, but you have TMD. Um, anyway, this is caused by clenching, grinding, sometimes stress, uh, and those kinds of things can be caused by malocclusion or even like injury to your uh, either joint or the mandible itself that can uh, lead to some type of disorder with the joint. Um, dental hygiene considerations for this is going to be that the patient can't open very big. Um, I make a joke all the time. Uh, I make a lot of jokes, but anyway, um, I talk to my patients whenever they come in and they can't open very big and they're like, oh no, this is all I can do. Um, I'm always like, really, like, how do you eat a hamburger? Like, come on now, you can't possibly eat your food. Like, you can barely get, I can barely get a mirror in there. You're telling me you get four bowls of food in there? There's no way. Um, um, so basically, if they have that limited opening, then they're probably going to be picking foods that aren't very hard to chew. Uh, whenever I talk to patients who, you know, talk about discomfort with their uh, TMJ, I typically will tell them to stay away from gum uh, because it's just too much work. And I mean, there's just no reason to do it. There, it's just a, a, I guess, a pleasant experience for them. I don't know. Um, and I tell them to stay away from foods that are really chewy, like uh, bagels are pretty hard to eat. Um, this is also your book brings in uh, the words tinnitus um, and crepitus. So tinnitus, I, I know you know these, uh, but tinnitus is ringing in your ears. This happens um, like whenever you're, it's kind of quiet, um, you hear kind of a high pitched sound. And then crepitus is going to be that cr uh, crackling or crunching sound whenever they open. Uh, this is usually made by the tendons that surround the joint kind of slipping in and out of place. Um, but uh, anyway, you, you don't really need to know that as much. It's just where your book decided to put the info. And that is the end of chapter 20.